We are going to get to started now, and uh, we're welcome to today's webinar. My name, we, let's move to the next slide, please. My name is Alex Bonardi, and to provide a brief visual description, I am a, a white middle-aged woman wearing dark framed glasses. Uh, I'm wearing a, a burgundy sweater, and I'm in my office with an abstract print behind me and a festive poinsettia on the desk beside me. Welcome to, today, to today's webinar. Uh, I am one of the co-directors of the National Center on Advancing Person-Centered Practices and Systems, and along with my other co-director, Bevan Croft, and our team here at HSRI, we're delighted to welcome you. Thank you for joining us to learn about the marriage penalty for people with disabilities and what that means in the context of person-centered supports. We would like to thank the Administration for Community Living and Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services for funding this webinar and uh, our center and for making these webinars free and open to the public. Next slide, please. The National Center on Advancing Person-Centered Practices and Systems is essentially designed and uh, to promote systems change that make person-centered principles uh, not just an aspiration, but a reality in the lives of people across the lifespan. Uh, this, this, we have many, many different aspects of uh, the work we do to focus in on making sure that supports for people, particularly people with disabilities, are person-centered, and this is this brings uh, today's conversation will bring uh, additional richness to the con the the whole construct of person-centeredness. Next slide, please. A few webinar logistics before we get into today's webinar. As you will note, participants are muted during this webinar. However, we have uh, the chat feature open and we encourage all participants to use this chat feature liberally. Uh, this is a place to ask questions for people to, um, to share uh, their excitement about the conversation that is happening, share ideas and resources as well. Toward the end of the webinar, our speakers will have an opportunity to respond to questions time allowed, um, as time allows. Please do go ahead and enter your questions into chat because uh, even if we do not get to every question, we do make sure that the speakers have a chance to review questions and can, we can make those responses available afterwards. This webinar will be live captioned in English uh, and live interpreted in Spanish. And there are instructions being entered into chat for accessing uh, the captions and for Spanish interpretation as well. Uh, there are, uh, on, on your screen, there are also descriptions of how you can access live captions by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and live Spanish interpretation by clicking the interpretation button as well at the zoom at the bottom of the zoom screen where it looks like there's a little world icon. This live webinar, we are going to have one poll and uh, and evaluation questions at the end, so we appreciate you being prepared to interact uh, with polling at those times. Next slide please. And after the webinar, you can. Um, you can send follow-up questions and feedback to about this webinar or any questions you might have to our web address ncapps at hsri.org. Please note this email address is not being monitored uh, during the webinar, so, uh, so uh, you can reach out through chat if you are having uh, issues or questions. An important thing to note is that the recorded webinar, this entire webinar, along with a version of slides and a plain language summary, will also be available within a few weeks on our website, 
ncapps.acl.gov. And at that time, as I mentioned, we'll also include questions and responses uh, to in, in those materials uh, as we post them. Next slide, please. And here's the important part as we get into our conversation with, uh, with our panelists today. It's, it's all of you joining us that makes this a very engaged conversation. And our panelists are really interested in hearing who is here with us today. So there is a poll that is open and I see that a number of people have started responding to the poll. Please note, uh, there is a little gray bar to the side of the poll. If you're looking at it, um, it's a little hard to see visually, which allows you to scroll down. And there are a few other response options if you don't see the whole long list there. So as we are seeing uh, responses coming in, we have about half of our participants who have responded. But with, uh, with the number of participants here, we are going to give a few more people, a few more seconds for people to go ahead and respond in. And I do see responses still coming in. So we're giving people just a little bit more time to make sure that uh, those who are working to get their responses entered are getting those entered in. I also see some folks are putting um, how they identify also into, into chat, which is wonderful too. Uh, th this really gives us a great sense of who all is here. So, okay, so let's see who, so, so we can share who is here. Uh, it looks like we have uh, the majority of folks who are joining in this webinar today. Well, just, just about, it's pretty evenly split between uh, people who identify as being a social worker, counselor, or care manager, uh, and government employees, federal, state, tribal, or municipal employees. Now, of course, that could be um, some people who are fit into both those categories, noting people you can you can choose more than one. Um, you can also, uh, we also are joined by uh, about 15% of people joining here identify as a person with a disability and another 16% as a family member or loved one. And uh, over 24%, about one fifth people here identify as self advocates. We also have peer mentors, researchers, and uh, people who represent community or faith based provider organizations. So, a, a good range of people. And, uh, and I do see that we've got some really uh, excellent uh, detail that people are adding in here into, uh, into chat as well. Thank you. And now, next slide, please. Let's move to uh, let's move to meeting our speakers of the day today. We are delighted to have such a rich group of panelists, and and I'm going to briefly introduce each of the speakers before turning over to our first uh, our, our first speaker. Uh, we have uh, Lydia X Z Brown, who is an advocate, uh, ad activist, scholar, attorney, and organizer. They are Director of Policy, Advocacy, and External Affairs at the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network and Founding Executive Director of the Autistic People of Color Fund. Lydia teaches courses in di Disability Studies, Women's and Gender Studies, and American Studies at Georgetown University and American University. They are co-president of the Disability Rights Bar Association and Disability Justice Committee representative on the National Lawyers Guild Board. We also have Shane Neumeyer joining us, who is a lawyer, activist, and community organizer, as well as an out and proud member of the disabled, trans, queer, and asexual communities. They are a trial attorney in the Commitment Defense Unit 
of the Committee for Public Counsel Services Mental Health Litigation Division. Previously, Shane worked with the Intersex and Gender Queer Recognition Project, Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network, Community Alliance for the Ethical Treatment of Youth, Connecticut Legal Rights Project, and Disability Rights New York, as well as in solo practice. We're glad you're both here. Next, Al Lewis and Renita Bundridge are elementary school sweethearts who have not been able to marry due to the marriage penalty for people with disabilities. Together, Al and Renita share their love story in support of marriage equality and with the hope of ending the marriage penalty so that others do not have to experience the pain they have felt as two people who love each other and should be able to marry. Al has been a board member of People First of Georgia since 2016. Renita was one of several founders of Long Road Home. She was president of People First of Atlanta for eight years. Renita was also founder of, uh, president of People First of Georgia for a year after being vice president for four years. We're glad you're both here too. Kyle and Stephanie Pelletier are a married disabled couple. Uh, once they were married, Stephanie's benefits went down to $8 and some cents. Getting rid of the marriage penalty has become a priority in their lives, as they know that other people with disabilities would love to get married and keep all their benefits. However, they must often settle for a relationship ceremony instead of being able to get married and maintain their quality of life. Kyle currently works for Speaking Up For Us in Maine, where he teaches and supports other self-advocates to create change in their community. Next, we have Aisha Elaine Lewis, who is a staff attorney and member of the leadership team at Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. She is a graduate of New York University School of Law, where she earned her JD in 2013 and LLM in taxation in 2015. Aisha uses her experience from various aspects of civil rights advocacy to inform her work to advance the civil and human rights of people with disabilities at the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. Her work spans a variety of areas, including marriage equality. And finally, in this panel, we are joined by David Goldfarb, who is the Director of Financial Security Policy at the ARC of the United States. Previously, he spent nearly eight years at the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, where he oversaw uh, that organization's advocacy initiatives. He currently co-chairs the Disability and Aging Collaborative and the Consortium for Constitu Constituents with Disabilities, Social Security, and Financial Security Task Forces. He was inducted into the National Academy of Social Insurance in 2017. We have a tremendous group of people here and uh, we're excited to hear from them. Uh, to get us started, I would like to turn this conversation over to David Goldfarb to help set up the background and context for, uh, for the rest of our discussion. And over to you, David. Great, thank you, Alex. Well, I'm David Goldfarb. Uh, uh, white male with uh, short brown hair and a uh, pink shirt on sitting in a, a background of bricks with an arc logo in the corner um, if we can get started the slides i'm going to give an overview of what are these marriage penalties and how why do they affect so many people with disabilities these marriage penalties are within two sections one is supplemental security income and the second is part of the social security system within a benefit called the Disabled Adult Child Benefit, or DAC for short. Sometimes it's called the Childhood Disability Benefit. Um, both of them are important benefits. Uh, supplemental security income is a means-tested benefit. Um, that DAC benefit is earned based on a parent's work record. And if you're someone with a disability, um, that had developed disability before the age of 22, you may qualify um, for this benefit based on your parent. If your parent retires, uh, develops a disability themselves or dies, and there's different benefit amounts. So those are the two um, 
systems and programs that have this marriage penalty, S SSI and DAC. Uh, next slide, please. And the reason that um, this is so important is not just for these cash benefits. You know, SSI's benefit is extremely low, the maximum of $841 a month this year, um, but it provides what's called categorical eligibility in most states um, to Medicaid. And Medicaid is what I think is the, the people on this webinar know, provides the long-term services supports in the community uh, that people need to survive. Uh, importantly, that uh, DAC benefit um, can also get you Medicare um, after a 24-month waiting period. And what we see a lot of at the ARC for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, yes, uh, Disabled Adult Child Benefit is what DAC stands for, and I'll, I can, I'll keep the longer term, uh, is that people start off on SSI, and then as they age, a parent may retire, they get uh, a benefit the DAC or Disabled Adult Child Benefit based on their parents' work record. But because they were on SSI first, they can still maintain their Medicaid uh, benefits so long as they uh, maintain the eligibility rules within SSI. So there's some complication there, um, but it allows them to get this bigger benefit. And OASDI stands for Old Age Survivors and Disability Insurance. Thank you. Uh, uh, for answering that in the chat. Uh, next slide, please. So what are these marriage penalties? Um, there's multiple marriage penalties within the, within those benefits. Um, and we're going to we're going to dive into uh, to all of them here. Um, the first is that if there are two couples that are both on SSI, um, so they're both on SSI, you can see a twenty five percent cut in their benefits and a 25% lower asset limit. The second is what happens when a SSI beneficiary marries a non-SSI spouse. And what happens is something called spousal deeming or uh, the program seeing the income and savings of that, of that non-SSI spouse is available uh, to the SSI beneficiary. And then finally, for the disabled adult child benefit, um, as we'll talk a little bit more about that benefit, if they're if they marry someone else with some exceptions, they lose their DAC benefit. And of course, with all of these, when you lose this benefit, you also lose Medicaid or you also lose Medicare. And so it's not just the cash benefit that's so important. It's the health and long-term service supports benefits that are tied to it. Uh, next slide, please. So the first one is um, to dive in a little bit deeper, the married, when two people are on SSI and would like to get married. Uh, and so what you can see here is that they face both a stricter asset test as well as a lower benefit amount. So right now, um, if you're unmarried, you can have $2,000 in the bank. Um, and so two individuals separate that are SSI beneficiaries could have 4,000 total. Um, but if they were to marry, they could only have $3,000 in the bank, lower benefit, uh, low, excuse me, lower asset limit. And obviously these asset limits are already painfully low. Um, that's something we've been working on this year. The second is the benefit itself. The maximum is $841 a month. That's 75% of the federal, about 75% of the federal poverty level. These are extremely low benefits. Those benefits get reduced uh, when they marry to a total of $1,261 for 2022 versus a potential, if they're separate, uh, $1,682. So this is a major, um, this is one of the marriage penalties and a, and a major one that prevents two SSI beneficiaries from getting married. Next slide, please. Next is what happens if an SSI beneficiary wants to marry someone who's not on SSI. And as we talked about, there's a concept of deeming where a portion of the non-SSI spouse's income as well as assets 
are allocated as part of that means testing. And so that impacts the benefits and eligibility. Countable assets get uh, brought together. And if that value exceeds $3,000, they're no longer eligible. The income that the non-SSI spouse um, can keep, and if they have children, there's a whole calculation, but it's extremely low uh, and really not, not feasible for most people. Um, and so next slide, please. I believe we might have some extra dollars there. Yeah, so it's a very small income is allowed for the non-SSI spouse below the poverty, poverty level, and uh, a modest amount of income uh, will basically reduce you to zero. And again, what happens when your SSI gets uh, reduced to zero? It can make you ultimately ineligible for Medicaid, which provides a service and supports. Um, so those are um, two of the, the penalties. And next slide, please. But it's even more than that, just when you thought it couldn't get worse, because the SSI statute isn't just looking at whether you're married. They're also looking at whether our people are holding themselves out as married. And so we see a lot of people who want to live together, as we'll talk about, and I'm sure we'll hear the stories about, but they can't because if they have a commitment ceremony, if they use the same last name, for instance, they're living together, they're sharing bills, there's a risk that the Social Security Administration will find them or uh, to be as if they are married. And so therefore the 25% lower uh, benefit, uh, the 25% the lower asset limit or the spousal deeming can actually apply to them as well. And so navigating what you even do before you get married and how far you can go in terms of say a commitment ceremony and then the, the ability to live together is a very thorny issue. Um, that's laid out in the statute, unfortunately. Uh, next slide. So those are the SSI marriage penalties. There's another marriage penalty within that disabled adult child or DAC benefit for short. Uh, again, DAC benefits, um, a lot of people on SSI transition to this DAC benefit as they age. You had to have developed your disability before the age of 22, and the child is insured by the parent's Social Security. So it's uh, it could be a survivor's benefit. It could be if your if your parent develop, needs SSDI or if they retire, you get a certain payment level, and that's that's often um, higher than SSI, which is why it's ideal. But if you get married, you could lose um, you can lose your benefit. And if you lose your benefit, you're going to lose your Medicare. Um, there are some exceptions. Um, if someone is on uh, old age Social Security benefits or they're receiving another secondary benefit called Title II benefits like SSDI or a survivor's benefit, then they don't lose their benefit. But importantly, if someone is on that uh, DAC benefit and they want to marry someone with an SSI, uh, that's an on, on SSI, that's not an exception. So that means that if they marry someone on SSI, um, they could lose their DAC benefit and their Medicare. Um, and so that's the DAC marriage penalty that we're working on. Uh, next slide, please. So there is some proposed legislation to try to address a number of this. Um, not going to pass this Congress. This is a long-term fight, um, but right now it's piecemeal. And I know uh, Aisha is going to talk more about what you can do. So I'll just be brief here. Um, there's legislation called the SSI Restoration Act, which addresses um, the SSI issues. There's a number. One, there's another one called the Marriage Equality for Disabled Adults Act, which eliminates that DAC marriage penalty. One other item I'll mention right now, we're, we're pushing as part of the ARC to raise the SSI asset limits under the Bipartisan SSI Savings Penalty Elimination Act. Importantly, that asset raise would address at least the marriage penalty there. So it would move it from $2,000 for individuals and $3,000 for couples 
to ten thousand dollars for individuals and twenty thousand dollars for couples. So it we um, so there there was a nod to try and address this marriage penalty, but it wouldn't fix the benefit issue. Um, so that's um, the marriage penalties that we're dealing with in a in a nutshell. And um, I will turn it over to um, uh, my colleagues to uh, share their stories. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. This is Alex. And um, in in a, a short while, David has shown uh, quite a number of the complexities as it relates to the marriage penalty. Absolutely. And, and of course, this is just the scratching the surface of, of how this is in people's actual lives. Uh, what we want to do is we want to turn to some of our other panelists who are going to speak from their experience about uh, their own relationships um, and ex experience there and, uh, and, and how this has played out in their own lives. And, and with that, I would like to invite Lydia and Shane to join uh, into this panel group and come off mute if you uh, end um, and off join us by video if you can. Hi, Shane. Hi, Lydia. And, um, and, and we'd like to hear from you about your story of how you met, your reflections of, on what the marriage penalty means for you. Um, and we'll, we'll start there. My name is Shane Neumeyer. Um, I use they, them pronouns. I am a white person with short blonde hair and glasses and a t-shirt sitting in front of a blank beige wall. Lydia? Hello. This is Lydia X. C. Brown. I am a youngish East Asian person with short black hair and glasses. I'm wearing a dark polo shirt, a jade necklace, and behind me is a fake background that shows some autumnal trees. It's a picture that I took when I was out on the campaign trail this year. Terrific. Glad you were both with us. So to get started, um, can I ask both of you to reflect a bit on how you met and what the marriage penalty means for you? Um, so we actually met through a college friend of mine and somebody who went to a writing program with Lydia during um, previous school years, like an extracurricular program. Uh, she put us in contact um, and we actually didn't meet for about a couple of years after that. Um, funny story, we met in person the day that I broke things off with my abusive quasi-ex. Like, I was literally getting on the bus sending this guy an email not to um, contact me if he wasn't going to shape up. And then I showed up at a meeting uh, for ASAM, Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, with Lydia, and we met for the first time that day. Um, we've been in a relationship since 2013 and we got married in 2019. So we're coming up on four years now, um, as of June. So three and a half years, technically. Um, and, um, anything to add there, Lydia, from your perspective? I always tell people that the two of us are both openly autistic, queer, non-binary lawyers who've worked on issues of deinstitutionalization and and abuse within disabled communities, and that none of that is how we met each other. Because I think it's hilarious that that's, we've ended up having some very, um, we've had, we've worked on many of the same issues. We've worked in parallel sometimes, our lives have had many parallels, but that's not how we met. We met because we're geeks, <laughs> that's how we met. And um, I, I love that about our relationship. But, you know, I think like the other couples who will be speaking, Today, you know, we had the privilege to be married, although why we got married was also a very disabled situation. Uh, do you want to share about how that happened? So in 2019, while I was running my own law practice, the American healthcare system happened, and I went from having mass health, which is the Massachusetts equivalent of Medicaid, and being able to run uh, what was effectively a small business, um, into losing my mass health 
because I made too much the first year of my practice and having to suddenly ration my seizure medications and stop my um, stop my ADHD medications altogether, which sent me into a mental and to some extent physical health tailspin. Um, all sorts of terrible things happened as a result of that. Um, but the non-terrible thing is that um, Lydia and I got married on the 50th anniversary, anniversary of Stonewall in 2019 in a small ceremony with some of our closest people. Um, and um, unfortunately, the circumstances that necessitated a quick wedding or that I needed health insurance very quickly. But... Um, I, I, I am very glad that we did finally, uh, get married rather than kind of, oh, one day we'll think about doing it. <laughs> Suddenly there was a fire under our butts and we went ahead and did it. And it was great despite the, ha the last minute nature of it. And, and you're describing an experience, Shane and Lydia, that uh, as, as we know, many thousands of people have in terms of uh, choosing the being pushed in or, or sort of choosing the time in which they're going to be married as well. What I wanted to ask you though is um, how can case managers or people who were supporting you or guiding you in any way um, best support you when it comes to personal relationships or marriage? Uh, what's some information that you would like to have? like to have had um, in, in terms of collecting up information and just knowing about what the marriage penalty means or might have mean, meant to you as you were um, as, as you were coming together in your relationship and thinking about what it what it means to you. Um, to be honest and fair here, neither of us have been on SSI benefits. Um, I was on Medicaid for low income reasons, but um, did not qualify for services. Um, what would be useful from my vantage point um, is to the extent that there are um, community mentors or other resources for people in the community who don't qualify to help connect people with resources, um, couples to um, for instance, work on setting up informal support. So if one spouse, for instance, in this case, it's usually me, has more serious disabilities in terms of affecting ADLs, it doesn't need, it shouldn't fall to the other person to be the caregiver just because they're the spouse. Unfortunately, given our system, we, in which, you know, treats us all as individual little family units um, disconnected from the larger social network such as it is in this country, um, it will usually be the responsibility of some other family member to act completely unpaid as a support person if somebody doesn't qualify or a, um, any kind of services. So helping people figure that out in advance, whether they're, as was more or less the case with Lydia and I, agreeing to do that for each other to the extent that it is mutual, recognizing that I really end up being the bulk of the care taking, um, needing side of things, um, to see if people agree to do that or if, they're saying if people they're looking at each other saying we're going to need more how to find that and helping people to arrange that if you are a mentor or a counselor or a service provider of any kind um and also to talk through just identify points of conflicting access needs that may or may not be able to be addressed by service providers of any kind to plan in advance, like Lydia and I unfortunately can't live together because of the nature of our disabilities, and thankfully we didn't try because before figuring that out, we just figured it out without doing that, but that could cause problems to have any support people, formal or otherwise, help people identify, okay, this is where your disabilities are going to cause problems in the relationship, and how do we mediate that before and during. Um, and account for that in services um, budgeted for otherwise um, that can be helpful for the relationship. 
This is Lydia. I would add to this conversation, and I apologize for the sake of our interpreters. I actually do have a sign name. It is L. Brown. Yes, thank you. Um, I would add to our to this conversation, right, that we know both as disabled people ourselves and as advocates in the disability community, that so many disabled people are caught in a trap where there is no middle middle ground, there's no intermediary period, the way that our current political system and economic policies are set up, where you are either trapped in poverty, ABLE account access notwithstanding, because many of the people that are meant to benefit from ABLE accounts, I saw some questions come in through the chat about that topic, are not actually able to open them, even though they're supposed to be, right? You're either trapped in poverty because of income and asset limits in order to receive social security funded benefits, which is the topic of today's conversation, or to be able to access other benefits, like to be able to access Medicaid funded long-term supports and services, for example, or, you make too much money to qualify, but not enough money to be able to private pay for necessary support or services or to maintain a decent standard of living. Decent being defined by whoever that person is and what counts as a decent standard of living. And um, the reason why our economic policies have created this trap is in, in my view, largely because we have tied employment and the ability to maintain what is considered a normal amount of employment, 32 or more hours a week of regular employment to the ability to have reliable access to healthcare and the ability to have reliable access to housing and food. If that were not the case, then disabled people who struggle to find or keep work or who are not capable of working 32 hours a week at all or consistently would not have to be reliant on an archaic benefit system that is designed with the idea that somebody is only receiving benefits for a very short period of time before presumably returning, quote unquote, to full-time work. A benefit system that in other words is very much rooted in very regressive social policies about socioeconomic class and the maintenance of wealth and resource hoarding, as well as trapping people in a cycle of poverty and being blamed for their own impoverishment when it's not an accident, it's not a passive experience, it's something that society causes. And then if you are a person who is not poor, but you're also not wealthy, then you're really screwed if you are a disabled person because you make enough money perhaps to afford your rent perhaps enough to afford food, but you are not necessarily making enough money unless you are extraordinarily wealthy or you're only paying somebody at minimum wage or under the table for a couple of hours of support a week. You are not making enough money to be able to afford to live, say, in a housing situation that is fully accessible. So I have friends who have different disabilities who live in Washington, D.C., who are forced to decide either to live somewhere where they could save a little bit of money, but the building will not be accessible and it will not have access to transportation to get to work, or to expend more than 50% of their take-home pay on rent so that they can live in a building that is actually accessible for their disabilities. And that's not really a real choice. Are those people poor or destitute? No, but they're also not able to fully exercise self-determination or to have the fully available range of choices that non-disabled people do. And if you do need support or services of literally any kind, a personal care attendant, you need somebody to assist you with homemaking services, you need someone to serve as a home health aide. And if it's not funded through Medicaid because you do not qualify for Medicaid, almost no private insurer, which underwrite nearly all employer-sponsored health plans will cover long-term supports and services. At best, you might qualify for temporary coverage of rehabilitation services if you have experienced a discrete injury and you have been discharged from an intermediate or skilled nursing facility back home, you might get a few weeks or a few months of payment and co coverage from your plan for those services. But if you need those services as a basic function of daily life, 
your plan will not pay for it unless it is Medicaid. So you either have to be trapped in poverty forever, even if you could work and wanted to work, or even if you wanted to work, but you can't work 32 hours a week, or you can't work reliably in a job that offers access to an employer-sponsored health plan, then you are also screwed because you work too much to have access to Medicaid. And then if you are privileged enough, and like we're both privileged and that we have access to employer-sponsored health care, right? That doesn't mean that your plan is going to fund any disability-related services. It might fund therapy, which is great, and I love therapy, and more people should be able to access it, and it's not affordable to a lot of people. But if you need regular support work in your daily life, you can't get it. And, and Shane, I'm sorry, I think you've been trying to say something. Yeah, I have. Um, there was an, a, a question about what is the solution to these problems? Universal housing that is accessible and universal health care. And I'm not talking about affordable. I'm talking about zero cost to anybody. You get what you need, all of what you need, because you are a person living in this society and no questions asked. That's the policies we need. And universal basic income, I would say as well. Terrific. Thank you, Shane, for um, for starting to answer that question because I was just about to, I, I was just about to ask that as well. So you know, with that, actually, I think this might be a great time to say really thank you, Lydia and Shane, um, for for sharing this experience and uh, the of of your lives with us as long as your great wisdom, as, as well as your great wisdom here. And I, I want us to turn to, um, to another couple panelists who we are going to hear from. And as I see a lot of action going on in chat, and as people are starting to come up with uh, suggestions about how to, how to start solving some of these challenges uh, so that people can truly uh, live in a way that they are living the, the lives of their choosing. Uh, th these are some of the solutions we need to get to. So with that, I, I want to turn the conversation to Al and Renita. And I, I'm going to start with th the same questions I started with Lydia and Shane. We, we were asked, I started by asking Lydia and Shane uh, the story of how you met and what the marriage penalty means for you. Yes, um, my name is uh, Al Lewis. I'm um, a African American male wearing a blue and a white collar shirt. And my name she she stated um, that she is her name is Renita Bundridge and she's an African American woman uh, with a black and gray striped shirt on and um, our our story is that um, we met uh, all the way back in um, 1988. Uh, we were uh, I was. Um, registering to be in uh, this elementary school, Law Ridge Elementary. Um, Renita was, uh, oh, oh, oh. she was 13 at the time. I was 11 at the time. And um, we met um, through the class and um, we used to always, uh, from the beginning, we both used to, it was something about, you know, we both were used like looking at each other and basically trying to, you know, we were basically interested in each other from way back then, but we, you know, just looked at each other and just constantly would, you know, always like, um, you know, look at each other and, and like try to, you know, find time to be, you know, with each other. We would like you know make time to the the you know see each other spend time with each other and um it started from there and um you know back then i called it you know it was popular we was young and everything and um but it um went from 
starting that way all the way through elementary up until um, we went to high school, um, the same high school together. And uh, we were, you know, still together and, and a couple and uh, well, what what the an interesting story is that um you know it started that way but as we got older um uh, Renita um she showed me you know that she was interested in uh you know by uh you know looking and how we stared at each other but at we got older she finally um sent her cousin over to uh just to officially approach me and to let me know that she was you know more than just interested in everything and um her cousin so she sent her cousin over and I she told me later on she did that because she didn't know like my reaction or what I would say or was you know I was really interested in everything so it 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 from there it started it, grew into a, you know a, a relationship we would you know come to school see each other and things like that and it was more of a school type uh relationship where we'd see each other at school and we you know eat lunch together and things like that and you know it went from there to um finally uh in high school i i graduated and um I was going off to college and I, I um I got like a sports um we used to play uh wheelchair sports also in school and um that's basically I got like a, a scholarship to attend a college in Wisconsin for uh playing on um, wheelchair basketball and um I left to go off to college and um we we talked over the phone a lot and we kept in contact and you know, we stayed in contact with each other until I was just so, you know, from being away and being my first time being away from home and being in an area where I didn't know anyone, I didn't do so good. I ended up just not focusing enough on, on the opportunity that was given to me. And I ended up back here in Georgia, back with, um, coming back home and uh, as soon as I got back, uh, we basically started off where we where we left off. We um, were still seeing each other. I was living home with my mom. She was living at home with her mom. And we would just make time to, you know, visit each other, see each other. And up until finally, a few years after that, I got what I am. Renita, she said she received a waiver. She received a, um, a, um, a Section 8 waiver to get her own um, place. And she moved and um, got her own place. And, and we started living together. And um, from then on, it's been, you know, from then on, it's been us together. And, you know, prior to us, being together, you know, living together, I myself didn't, I had no knowledge of, you know, the marriage penalty in itself. I had no idea of what that meant or I was under the impression that people still could marry anyone you want. And I had no idea of that. It, she informed me of that. And, you know, ever since she has informed me of it, it's been a passion of ours to try to, you know, do whatever we can to try and 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 get, you know, that situation to where it's no longer because it it doesn't make sense to me to, that you or anyone should be not able to be well marry the person that they love and want to be with. It just doesn't make sense to me because I, I always, prior to me knowing that, I always felt and knew or thought that anyone, if you you meet a person, you love them, you can marry them, and and that was the case, you know. But I didn't I didn't know that there was this thing called a marriage penalty. But 
ever since of me being informed of it, that's been a passion of ours, you know, just to make sure that no one has to, you know, if possible, go through a situation like that to where you love each other, you should be able to marry. I mean, it's, it's just not enough to, some people will say, well, you're asleep, you're, you're living together, you're, you're having that life, but it's not enough to just have that, in my opinion. If I think that I should be able to legally marry her and, and you know, have a ceremony and legally be able to marry her without having any issues. And I think that that's something that should, should not be an issue. And we should be able to do that. Anyone should be able to do that. Yeah, Al and, and Renita, thank you for, for sharing your story so much and your passion and, and actually speaking the truth about, yeah, everybody should be able to do that, of course. You said that you're, you're really interested in, um, in advocating, being advocates to, to you know, work and, and make sure that, um, that anybody who wants to get married can. How, could you talk a little bit about how others, well, your experience, um, what you have been doing to advocate for this, um, and, and some suggestions for how people can advocate so that people with disabilities um, just have the right to get married without worrying about losing their benefits. Um, uh, 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 I did. Before the pandemic, oh, yeah, she was stating that. You know, prior to the pandemic happening, we were very much active in, you know, going to see our, you know, legislators and going to the Capitol and, and trying to, you know, make this issue known and, the, you know, just keep the issue itself out there and spread and spread it as, as, you know, far and wide as we could, you know, to keep people and and the legislators you know on the topics uh, believe it or not it's a lot of that whole issue of the marriage penalty a lot of people who are not affected by it or don't know about it, it they think that doesn't even know that it exists they don't even know so it's like a, a issue of educating and letting people know you know that it, it, it's a real thing and it's something that really needs to be dealt with and done with you know and we that's a, a way how we go out and um keep it out and keep that um it out there and people talking about it and, and um another thing that we were doing were we were going out and just speaking like how we're doing now speaking to you know certain people who would allow us and would invite us to speak um, on behalf of the, you know marriage penalty and let people know that it exists and and you know let them know that you know basically our advice would be you know to go to your leg your state legislators that are in your state and to just try to keep the um keep it out there and keep it you know to where it's known and people it, you know if you don't talk about certain things that people it, they, they won't think about it so it's just basically keeping it out there and, and trying to to get them um get it um out there as much as possible It, it, it sounds like you've been busy uh, it, it, getting the word out. Absolutely. And um, honestly, just starting with the awareness that um, marrying someone you love is one of the basic human rights 
that people have. And, and I think people maybe do have an assumption that that is a right that everybody has available to them. Yeah. Um, in terms of, um, Al, you said that, that you weren't just, you, you just weren't aware about the, the marriage penalty, even, you know, when, when you were coming into your relationship and, and um, living with Renita, what advice could you give to case managers or service coordinators or people to help give services to just help raise the awareness and help people navigate this and make change? Oh, well, you mean, well, she said that uh, basically people who, like you said, work in the field that deal with dis disabled people, she was stating that, you know, in her opinion, she feels that they should, uh, the best way that they could, or uh, one way that they could help is, as you say, is to talk to them and, 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 and ask them, like, basically, what's, you know, the care, their caregivers in general could talk to them and, and try to, you know, ask that same question that you saying to um, see what they could do best to help them for the for you know the in their way of, of, of what they're going through as far as that's concerning them and everything like that and um, I also think that a good thing is I always say like you know awareness awareness I I a big on just you know I don't think things are getting uh, would get changed or wouldn't be changed if the awareness wasn't brought out and just to constantly aware you know to make the congressmen your your state officials aware of the situation and to like you know just keep it out there and 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 I don't think I think that that would be the spark that would actually get something done if they were to just be constantly made aware of that situation and, and, you know, keep it on their minds and to keep them thinking of it. And that's the only way I believe that a change will even be made, you know? So. Yeah. And, and Renita and Al, I so appreciate both of you bringing your voices into this conversation because you're right, that awareness part of it um, is critical as a foundation for the work. And thank you for all the work that you're doing to continue to talk to people and keep it going. Um, please go ahead. No, I was just saying absolutely. I I was just basically saying thank you and absolutely great. So, Al, I I I think we're we've been seeing a lot of conversation going on in in chat as well, um, and and Renita and I I think there's a lot of appreciation also for for the work you are doing. Um, with with that, I would like to actually say we'd like to bring uh, another perspective into this conversation and uh, invite Kyle and Steph uh, to join us to share their reflections and, uh, and, and their story as well. So thank you uh, to Al and Renita and Kyle and Steph. Welcome to the stage, uh, as, as it were. Uh, and and I'm starting with the same question here. If you could uh, start in and say hello and tell uh, tell the story of how you met and 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 what the marriage penalty means for you. Well, well, thank you for having us. Uh, well, my name is Kyle Pelletier. I'm a white man with black hair and a black beard with a gray button up shirt and we're in our background is a uh, back wall of a kitchen so hi my name is Stephanie Pelletier I'm a white female I have dirty blonde and red highlights in my hair oh yeah and my uh 
I have a blue shirt on. So yeah, me and Steph, we met at our local day program and we kind of, it's actually a nice story because it was me and her, it's like, it was actually her first or second time going to the day program. And she kind of, when she came in, she saw me and she kind of said, wow, look at this handsome guy. So she was kind of like playing with her hair and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and then I kind of looked at it, how she was looking at me. I was kind of thinking back in my head that this person likes me. So I just let it go a little bit. Then it came to like our break and she came to sit next to me. And it's like, okay, why is this person sitting next to me? I think she back again think she likes me so then we kind of just started talking at a, one of our programs and at first she didn't have my Facebook so I kind of like found her Facebook before her and added her then she kind of added me after then she kind of wanted me to go like hang out with her for her birthday but I kind of said well I want, I want to meet your parents before I do that. So just to give her respect wise. And she said, okay. So I met her, met her parents. And then we kind of, kind of started dating and kind of happened like that. So. Okay. Before we got married, I, my social security was 700 something and 75 cents. And when we got married, it went down to $6 and 75 cents. And then cost of living went up. So I got $14 and 75 cents. Then I was supposed to get uh, $23 and 75 cents the beginning of January. But then I got a letter from Social Security a couple of days ago, said that I'm going to lose that uh, $23.75. So then I felt, I felt lower than low because I was getting $0. So I felt like I was not independent anymore so and i have my mother-in-law that wants to say a few things that for a mother and a children caseworkers experience of a dealing with a child that has social security and losing it by nothing so i'll kind of turn it to her and just hello my name is Cindy Tardif. I'm Stephanie's mother. I've been her biggest advocate since she was a child. Identify your red, white, black hair. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm white. I have dark hair and a maroon shirt. I'm in the same kitchen as Stephen Kyle. <laughs> he described it a while ago. Um, Stephen Kyle have been together for a long time, for about 10 years before they got married. And Stephanie's a devout Catholic. And she uh, was getting her full benefits living with us. Our income did not matter. She had her full benefits. And so she was independent buying her clothes, you know, food, uh, vacations. And she had money to, if she needed her, uh, her, her personal items. So she was pretty independent. So when we go on vacation, she had her money and whatever. So... She met Kyle, she fell in love, and they chose to not live together. Like I said, Stephanie's a devout Catholic, and she wanted to be God, right in God's eyes. And she thought, well, um, before I get married, I, we got to find out from Social Security how much benefits she would lose. So Stephanie's case manager, myself, Kyle's case manager, we call Social Security, and they determined it would be about maybe $200 that she'd end up getting. I thought that was bad at the time. 
but the end result ended up being $6.75. I almost fell on my butt when he told me that. It's like, that doesn't even pay for her personal items, you know, her monthly things. So how does that even make sense? So I said, so now what's happening is that she went from being dependent on herself to now being back to dependent to our parent, her parents. Because Kyle's on a fixed income. He's on social security benefits. And he's on disability as well. So they're saying that because he has SSDI and SSI, which he was only getting $23 as a side based on because of Stephanie, and she was getting now $23. And because his income went up a little bit, he works 20 hours a week. Now cost of living went up, social security income went up. So she lost her social security. I'm thinking like, so she went from poverty to below poverty. And my husband's on social security because he's retired. I'm retiring in four years. So right now I'm, you know, we made an order of clothes through Venus. Okay. Guess who's going to be paying it. It's going to be me. She has no more money. They're paying their fuel. They're paying their, um, uh, rent. And they have a little bit of help, not with the rent, but a little bit of help with fuel. And right now it's been about 600 gallons or $600 a year. But their uh, oil is two, over 2,000. It'll leave, even be more than that now because of how things went up. So I, I, so I called Social Security. And they said it was based on Kyle's income, that it went up a little bit. And plus, uh, Social Security went up on their income, making her lose hers. So when Kyle went to Washington, D.C. to advocate for the marriage penalty and against that, they were focused on... Uh, the equality of equality of marriage, which I saw the president sign. Uh, but for marriage penalty, they they told Kyle we wouldn't know where to get the money for to fund that. And I said to Kyle, what my response would have been to that? She had the money. You took it away. Right. She already had it. Right. So and they're the, keeping this, her this... Below poverty. The, so the story have... that you bring is, is um, really um, such a clear, clear picture of, you know, a, a problem that, that is, you know, brought into people's own experiences. And, and it, it really is, it's a painful story, honestly, to, to, to hear. And to also, hopefully, this is something that uh, we can use to fire people up to understand what this all means in people's lives so we um, have spoken to the legislators we have and we yep. feel like we're talking to deaf ears and yep. 2050 years ago they started with the social security back then you couldn't have more than two thousand dollars in your bank account if you're one person but then if you're a married couple you can't have more than three thousand why can't it be four but anyway three thousand but that was 50 years ago 50 years ago, that was a lot of money, okay? Today, it's not a lot of money. And they're still having the same guidelines. It, it, I can't even, con it's not comprehensible. Absolutely. And, and even starting from the earlier remarks that, that David Goldfarb shared, the, I think that, that the collective group of us here are recognizing that there are so many things that need to be addressed. And actually the asset limit that you just mentioned is absolutely one of them. Um, we, we have just a couple more minutes before we turn to our next panelist. And I, I wanna ask you, Kyle and Stephanie, um, when you have been advocating, have you been, uh, what is the, the one message, the one thing that you are really looking uh, for legislators to change when you go and have a conversation um, in Washington and, and as you're traveling around advocating against the, what, what's happened with the marriage penalty? One, one question I want them to, to answer that we want, like, I want them to bend backwards to help us out to make sure that we get our voice, like our voices heard that 
the marriage penalty needs to be eliminated because it's it's not right because people with disabilities should be able to have equal what rights to get married, be happy, start a family, and actually have both incomes and make sure that you're above property so you can actually have a half decent life. And I want them to hear, hear that and say, I know how you feel. And I want to work harder to get the, this eliminated. Can I say one thing? This is Cindy again. Um, the advice when we did seek out to like Pine Tree Legal and when this first happened, when they got married and they lost even more, she lost even more than what we were expecting. The advice, the advice that they are getting, get a divorce. That's, and, and, and that, that's not for lawyers and case managers to make a decision about when people marry and when people divorce. I mean, that, that is something that you're really, um, you're, you're really pointing to something that we've also heard folks have, have heard. Thank you so much for the story, Cindy and Kyle and Stephanie for, for bringing this forward. I know it, it, it it's a difficult, um, situation that, that you were in. And, and I think I am I'm really hearing a lot from, or seeing a lot in chat too. Yeah. It just, it just frustrates me that every, I'm telling my story as, as hard as I can. I, I keep going to DC and I keep going to this and it's like, it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. It's going moves. And they said, keep trying to tell your story. Keep, keep pressing the story. Keep doing this. Keep doing that. Keep doing that. It's like, how it's like how many how much times do i have to do it do i have to do it until i'm blue in my face or like six feet under it's yeah. it's sad it's like everything else gets like ahead of this and people with disabilities are still under property and there's continue getting struggles and there's always that wall that needs to be broken down and it's like we go to talk to the people that we need to talk to and we had to wait for all these co-sponsors just to actually sponsor these bills and to get into their communities to hear from us then go back to the capitol hill for them to vote on it it's like and stephanie and Kyle are at risk of having uh you know, displacement because their place is like falling apart and they need to have a new place. And we have a piece of land next door that we would have like a well and sewer put in for them and everything. But we wanted to build them a tiny little home, but they can't even afford for us to help them. And we would be giving them land, but we they can't do it. Yeah, yeah. right. And, so we, and we want to be able to have kids, but it's hard. Right, all the, all of the, the the pieces of a true and loving relationship that everybody has a right to, right, Stephanie. So, so it's like with the so, other. Or sorry, just like with the other couple, and it's like they're they're working like pushing things. It's like, what what more can we do? I can't cry that enough. What more can we do? Yeah, Kyle, and 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 that's where I, I want to try and take this conversation to, um, and and this is going to be uh, uh, maybe difficult to invite you into the room, uh, uh, Aisha, at this point. But Aisha, Elaine, uh, Lewis is uh, somebody who we want to make sure that we hear from you, and I also want to say thank you, Kyle and Stephanie. Uh, because I think Aisha, uh, Elaine, you, you can provide some of um, some of some more context and discussion about what, what's coming next and and what what can happen in some of this fight for people's rights. So with that, I wanted to turn it to you for for some of your comments. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, my name is Aisha Elaine Lewis. I am an African American woman with brown and blonde dreadlocks and a white sweater against a beige background. Um, 
And I would also, I also look like I have a annoyed expression on my face because I always get annoyed when I go over these archaic rules that harm so many people with disabilities. Um, I'm also a person with disabilities and so it feels personal. Um, and, you know, we all deserve our rights to have marriage, family, love, make our own life choices. Okay, so to your question about what can we do to support efforts to end marriage penalties? Well, the first thing we could do is learn more. David's overview of the SSI and DAC marriage penalties gave you all a sense of how complex these rules are. If you're interested in learning more, feel free to check out DREDF's marriage equality page, and I'll drop that link into the chat. And this will also be provided for folks afterwards as well. You can find fact sheets and annotated bibliography a link to a more detailed workshop that David and I gave on this topic and another and other resources as well. David might have additional links um, from the ARC to share as well. Another thing that folks can do is support legislative reform. As David mentioned, there have been about five bills introduced in the current Congress, which would address different aspects of the marriage penalties. One powerful way to support passage of those bills is to contact your Congress members to express support for these issues. Members of Congress take notice when their constituents care enough about an issue to write a letter or call. It doesn't have to be you know, anything complicated or fancy. It's better if it's not a form, but just simply taking the time and effort to show that you care means a lot and they do notice. The more voices um, that are reaching out to members of Congress, the more powerful um, the impact will be. The recent passage of the Respect for Marriage Act shows that support for marriage and family are issues that can be potentially bipartisan, even in divided government. And we're hopeful that you know, folks across the aisle will, um, I'm sorry, on both sides of the aisle, will be amenable to hearing about the real life impacts of these penalties on folks and how much you know, people across society want to see them end. Another thing that we can do is sharing our story. As you saw today, the real life stories of people facing these marriage penalties make the issue more real than a fact sheet or a journal article ever could. Both DREDF and the ARC are collecting stories from folks who are directly impacted by these penalties. If you are interested in sharing your story, I'll drop um, the DREDF link to share your story in the chat. There's also, Oh, okay, it's been shared already. Okay, great. Um, there's also a link that the ARC has as well. Um, another thing folks can do is help build awareness. Too many people still aren't aware that these marriage penalties exist. And some only find out about these penalties after they're married and are hit by them. If you want to share your own story directly on social media platforms, you can use some of the hashtags that we've been using. Hashtag marriage equality, hashtag marriage penalties, love tax, and the love tax. You can also share social media posts to amplify the work shared by groups like the ARC and DREDF. So if you see the ARC posting something about these marriage um, penalty issues, you could retweet it. You could share it with your networks to help get more people seeing these issues and knowing about them. Uh, sorry, hold on. In addition, um, people can file complaints directly with the Social Security Administration. Um, last month, Dreda filed an administrative complaint on behalf of Lori Long, requesting a waiver of the DAC marriage penalty on the basis of religious freedom. The Religious Freedom and Restoration Act, otherwise known as RIFRA, requires the federal government to provide exceptions when federal law or policy substantially burdens someone's religious freedom. So as a devout Christian and a Sunday school teacher, Lori has strong religious beliefs about marriage. And therefore, what the complaint asks is that the um, Social Security Administration, which is a part of the federal government, waive the rules about marriage and benefits so that she can engage in the religious sacrament of holy matrimony, aka marriage. 
So one high profile example of RIFRA being used recently is the Hobby Lobby case, where um, the privately held corporation argued that it had religious freedom um, interests in not having to provide certain kinds of health care to employees. And so RIFRA is out there, RIFRA is being used, and you know we think at DREDF that it's a potential tool for folks to use to advocate to, to get an individual kind of relief. Um, now, we haven't actually gotten the administrative complaint uh, resolved yet, so folks might want to wait a little bit to see what happens with lorries. But if you want to do it on your own, that's something you can explore with, you know, with counsel, with your um, advisors, to see if that's an avenue you're interested in. Um, you can read our complaint and press release, and I'll drop the links for those as well. In a recent op-ed, Nancy Altman from Social Security Works called on the Biden administration to provide waivers to people who seek to marry for religious reasons, or if they don't want to do an individual waiver for millions of benefit recipients, they could simply announce a waiver for everyone receiving SSI and DAC um, under the authority of RIFRA. And so, um, again, I'll share the links that were listed that I discussed, and it'll also be provided after the training. Are there, does anyone have any questions? Well, that, um, I, I think probably there are many questions probably, but the richness of uh, some of the resources and some of the actions that are being taken, I, I really appreciate. And before I, uh, I hand it over to my colleague, Bevan, I just wanted to say thank you to Aisha and uh, to all of our panelists who have shared both the, their passion and, and, and their love stories right? Uh, this afternoon, I don't know that we've had quite as many love stories packed into one NCAPS webinar um, ever before. So, so thank you for, for all of this, uh, as well as bringing forward the really, really important issues that we still have to work on. And with that, I wanted to invite Bemin uh, to bring us uh, to, to a possibly one or two questions we could ha have uh, and then wrap us up. Hello, everyone. This is Bevan Croft. I am a white woman with blonde hair up in a bun. I have bangs behind me uh, is my home office that has many plants. Um, we have just a couple of minutes um, if anyone does have a question um, that they'd like to ask, please put it into chat. Um, we received a lot of technical questions that I think may be better uh, answered in writing, um, but we did uh, have someone wondering earlier on uh, about um, how um, marriage rights play out for people with conservatorships, uh, people under guardianship. And I expect we could do a webinar on that topic uh, alone, but I wanted to um, raise uh, this to our panelists and see if any of you have anything to add. And David, I see you've gone off cam uh, on camera. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, it's a complicated question because it's a it depends on the state statute. Um, I think generally speaking, there are limited powers for the ability to divorce and i know attorneys are loath to do that but i was there was actually a recent uh supreme court of kentucky case that dealt with the issue of divorce when uh a young woman married someone with alzheimer's was convicted of uh felony financial misappropriation of his funds and was um, set to receive his funds as inheritance although she would be in jail for about 10 years as a result of her financial exploitation um, they were under a guardianship and the guardian was able to get um divorce um so that adds that does add an extra layer of complexity as well as what are the rights to um get married if you are if you are under conservatorship or um guardianship and the answer is probably you're not 
So that's another way in which um, people's rights might be infringed. The uh, And so a big thing that the ARP works on, and I think a lot of others work on, is something called supported decision-making and other means to keep people as free as possible so they, they can choose who they want to live with. And that's, you know, um, probably someone referring to, for example, the Britney Spears case where she was not able to marry someone. Um, so it's both, that's a, again, a complicated state question. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that, but it's definitely an issue. This is Bevan. Thank you, uh, David. Um, we've gotten a couple other questions in chat um, really related to action. So any tips um, for, um, you know, how to get representatives uh, in person to speak to this issue? Um, and also, are there any bills with bill numbers um, that folks can use to contract to, to, as they contact? Um, and and um, oh, I will I will sort of quickly say um, that there are bills listed in the PowerPoint, and if anyone wanted to drop them into chat, um, we could we could put uh, put those there. We will also be sure at the end of this webinar um, when we put the materials up on our website, uh, we will include all of the resources that we've described today to cut it together in one place. Um, call it your advocacy toolkit, and um, and that'll be a resource for you. We have come to the end uh, of our time together. Um, I, I think I probably speak for many of you that my heart has been on a roller coaster this afternoon, um, you know, fluttering and, and, and excited with, with how romantic um, and beautiful these stories are um, and outraged and heartbroken. Uh, for our, our panelists as well, knowing that our panelists are speaking, um, you know, um, stories that hundreds and, uh, and, and hundreds of thousands of, of people with disabilities across the country uh, are experiencing. So I, I hope that um, uh, everyone channels uh, this experience and these feelings um, into, into action um, as, we, as we work to, to support mar uh, marriage equality for all. All right, so um, I have one final poll uh, to invite you to take. We take uh, continuous quality improvement very seriously at the National Center on Advancing Person-Centered Practices and Systems. So please help us before you leave this afternoon uh, by taking the six question post-webinar evaluation before you head out. We use your feedback, we look at it every time, uh, every webinar, and we use it to, um, to improve. Um, I, I hope that we can continue discussion on this topic and um, we will have uh, webinars coming up this year that touch on some of the issues that came up in chat. So please do stay tuned. Please do join us again. It was wonderful to have you here. Um, and huge, huge appreciation to our panelists, uh, David, Lydia, Shane, uh, Renita and Al, Kyle and Stephanie. Um, and Stephanie's mother-in-law, uh, and Kyle's uh, mother-in-law, Stephanie's mother. Um, I apologize, I have, your name escapes me. Um, and Aisha, uh, for sharing your wisdom and your experiences. We are grateful to you, and I wish everyone a good afternoon. <laughs>